Uh, well, welcome everyone to this uh, uh, webinar event uh, on heat pumps and the VEU, an introduction to design considerations. My name is Jared Leake and I'm the CEO for the Australian Alliance for Energy Productivity or A2EP as we're more commonly known as. I'd like to start this uh, webinar with uh, an acknowledgement to the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And I'm sure you'll join me in paying our respects to their elders. And if you'd like to uh, acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of the land of which you're on, feel free to pop that into chat. Uh, for me, that's the uh, Daramurugul lands, the Daramurugul people. And uh, pay my respects to elders like uh, Auntie, Auntie Edna does fantastic work within, in the Aboriginal and the community through the uh, Darug area. And so for today's uh, webinar, we'll be recording this session and uh, that the recording and the slides will be issued uh, sometime next week to everybody that registered. Uh, we're hoping for a nice interactive session. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of, of, the, uh, of, of our three presentations today. So feel free to type those in and we'll, we'll be sure to get to those. Or if you want to type a little bit of a side chat in, in, the, in the chat bar, uh, absolutely go for it. Uh, but we'll endeavour uh, to get through all your questions and what have you. Uh, just quickly on, on A2EP and a little bit who we are, um, we're a, a non-for-profit organisation uh, funded by our members who share our goal in improving Australia's energy productivity. Uh, this uh, wonderful set of members uh, really helps us uh, uh, bring such research like what we're doing today, uh, along with our work with, with DELP. And uh, you'll see we've got a really good range of, of members that uh, takes us uh, fabulous connections to uh, manufacturers, to research, uh, to equipment suppliers and energy consultants, uh, as well as utilities. Uh, and it really gives us a fantastic uh, uh, collective brain to tap into when we're doing pieces of work like this. Uh, but we also like to go broader as well. And we have been doing that in this piece of work. Uh, to kick things off today, I'd like to welcome Jack Brown from DELP, uh, just giving us a bit of a flavour of, of this uh, piece of work and, and, and what we're trying to achieve here. And then I'll step through uh, the presentations and, and some of the deliverables that we're planning uh, for, through this series. Uh, Jack, if you're, you're there, you'll have to come off mute and, and bring the video on and uh, say a few words, please. Thanks, Jared, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jack Brown, Manager Energy Efficiency Technologies at the Victorian Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, or DELP. And I lead the team who work on new and advised activities for the Victorian Energy Upgrades or VU program. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure today to join you and to work with Jared and the A2EP team on this really important project. Commercial industrial heat pump water heater activity was a long time in the making, and it was great to see it introduced into the VU program on the 1st of February this year. Uh, we work closely with our colleagues in the New South Wales ESS scheme on the development of the activity and I'd like to thank them for their collaboration and support and I hope they've joined us today. Uh, one of the objectives of the VU program is to reduce the consumption of electricity and gas and the CNI heat pump water heater activity provides a, a really fantastic opportunity for commercial and industrial sites to reduce their, uh, to increase, improve their gas efficiency and reduce their energy costs. Uh, this can only be done effectively though if heat pump water heater technologies are designed, selected and installed in the correct way. And it is of critical importance that all VU program participants, including product manufacturers, credit providers and installers know and understand how to do this. So we wanna make sure end users get really good outcomes from the activity. And this uh, in industry capacity building project that we're working on with A2EP is, is really a great way to support that goal. Um, thanks for taking the time to participate in the webinar today. I hope you find it useful. And thanks to you as well, Jared, back to you. Uh, many thanks, Jack. And yes, we, it, this is all about making uh, successful installations. And, and it, it's a case of when you're changing from that existing technology, likely to be a hot water uh, a generator or a gas boiler or a steam boiler, um, you know, this, 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 it is not a like for like change. It does require a set of different thinking and skills um, and when you tap into that, uh, you'll see there's some fabulous, fabulous benefits of the change. Uh, so the main deliverables we have with the work that we're doing with DELP is this uh, a general design guide, 
application guides for uh, aquatic centres, agriculture, which focus mainly on dairy farms, and then multi-unit uh, residential buildings. And, and within each of those, uh, we're trying to really give uh, some good practical guidance of, 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 uh, of how to make a heat pump a successful installation. We'll also share uh, plenty of case stories uh, for these uh, different areas as well, uh, so that you know who to speak to and learn from other people's mistakes, so to say. Um, A2EP has done a lot in this space, so we've been working on this for many, many years, and uh, uh, we've done uh, various guides and, and, uh, and roadmaps and what have you, and, but the, the large piece of work we've done is with uh, ARENA, uh, where we've carried out some 20 or so uh, pre-feasibility studies and seven feasibility studies uh, on various industrial applications for heat pumps, and with there we come to learn a lot about the tricks of the trade of, of what it means to install a heat pump really well. We've got those in in our publications you'll find them on our website and and we've actually uh, prepared a, a a website called futureheat.info where we're bringing together already uh, case stories and um and, and publications all nicely in one place that that website and the work is is somewhat industrial focused this piece of work is is a bit more on the commercial uh, building focus and obviously multi-unit resi as well um so it is it is a little bit different and growing on on previous uh, amounts of work as well uh, just to let you know the other part that we've been doing is, is a series of modeling uh, for the impact of heat pumps uh, and, and hopefully that's going to be uh, released by DISA in the coming months and, and we certainly see that will have an even uh, greater impact and greater focus on heat pumps going forward. Um, so to talk uh, this through today, uh, we've got uh, three presenters. Uh, we're joined first of all by Alan Piers, a Senior Industry Fellow for RMIT and uh, all things energy efficiency guru. Uh, he works very closely with A2EP and uh, he'll join us in just a moment. And then we're going to have uh, Ahmed Majuri, uh, from also works with RMIT and has worked on previous uh, modelling cases and, and done work with renewable process heating uh, with, with the likes of ARENA and ITP reports done earlier. And finally, we'll have Alastair McDowell, a director from Energy AE, uh, take us through the VU method and, and, uh, and how, go, how to go about registering a piece of equipment there. Um, so this is, as I mentioned before, this is the first of two webinars. Uh, this one really focusing on, on the generic uh, and uh, design guides and really understanding the fundamentals of heat pumps. And once you understand those fundamentals, really understanding how best to make that installation. Um, and so with that, I'd actually like to, to kick off first with Alan Pierce, who's going to take us through those heat pump fundamentals and, and give us that really good understanding. And I, I trust you're, you're in no better hands uh, to be taught about a technology and the fundamentals than from Alan Pierce. Uh, Alan, if I get you to start sharing your screen and over to you. Alan, we've got that one. Just need you off mute, and I think we're in business. Oh dear, so excited to be here. I forgot to unmute myself. Anyway, good. Uh, well, thanks very much, Jared. Um, so my my job is to kind of give some introductory perspective on on the, the principles underlying heat pumps, and so of course the first thing is to highlight to people that we actually have heat pumps all around us. Uh, but not necessarily for the purposes that we're starting to use them for. So it's we've got familiarity, but there's a lot of tricks to the trade. So just to start with the basic concept of a heat pump, um, it's essentially a loop of pipe with refrigerant in it. Uh, and that refrigerant uh, gets pressurized and depressurized and uh, evaporated and liquefied. So if we start in the bottom left hand corner with the cold liquid, uh, it passes through what we call an evaporator because basically it that's where the liquid evaporates into a low pressure gas. And a, an everyday example of this sort of situation is if you've got a puddle of water, it absorbs energy from the wind and the sun and it evaporates into a low pressure gas uh, in the atmosphere. So that's, that's basically what you're doing here with this through this heat exchanger where uh, ambient energy, heat energy is being absorbed by, by the liquid. Then we go through a compressor which compresses this low pressure gas into a hot high pressure gas. 
And an example here is a bike pump. And if you pump up your bike tire, you feel uh, the bottom end of the pump getting hot because the gas, the air is being heated as it gets pressurized. So now we've got a, a hot gas. Uh, so then that goes through another heat exchanger called the condenser because that's where the gas condenses back into a liquid. And this is a bit like, for example, the humid air from your clothes dryer um, cools against the window, dumping heat outside into the outdoors and becomes a liquid and becomes runs condensation running down your window. So that's the kind of thing we've got there. Um, then this still high pressure liquid goes through an expansion device or, or uh, pressure reduction valve, whatever, uh, and essentially uh, becomes the cold liquid, which is where we started. And an example of uh, an expansion device like that is simply a spray can. If you think about it, you, you press the button on your spray can and uh, something comes out and the, the can starts to feel colder. So that's what's going on. Um, another important issue here is that uh, our perceptions of what's hot and cold are very subjective. And the laws of thermodynamics, which drive the heat pump, actually have a zero point at minus 273 degrees uh, or zero degrees Kelvin or absolute zero. Uh, and so the reality is even very cold air or snow actually has a lot of heat energy in it. And that's why a heat pump can work in Northern Europe or Canada or all sorts of places uh, if you design it properly. And that's where we keep coming back to this fundamental problem if we design things properly. So uh, now this is a complex graph. Uh, it's, it actually is only going to make a couple of points. The first point is that people, when they're talking about heat pumps, talk about coefficient of performance or COP. The COP is really just the efficiency of the system divided by 100. So if you've got a 100% elect, uh, efficient electric fan heater, then that has a coefficient of performance of one. Uh, so a coefficient of performance of four means you're being four times as efficient as the most efficient electric heater you can think of. That's because a heat pump is not converting one form of energy into another. It's actually extracting energy from one place, concentrating it and then uh, shifting it to somewhere else. This graph really just highlights the core elements of the previous graph and adds the orange line, which highlights the percentage change in coefficient of performance that you get by reducing the temperature lift across the heat pump by one degree. And so what this highlights is that the temperature difference between the evaporator and the condenser of a heat pump is incredibly important uh, if you want an efficient heat pump with high capacity, you want to get the lowest temperature lift across the heat pump that you can. And you'll hear tonight uh, how there's lots of ways of doing that. Lots of air source heat pumps also have to work in a context where they're drawing ambient air uh, from the local environment. And in Melbourne in the middle of July, you know, there are times when it's around zero Celsius or minus or, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and under those conditions, if you're trying to provide high temperature heat, your coefficient of performance will be pretty low and you'll need to install a bigger and more expensive heat pump if you just respond to, to designing it for the extreme conditions. But you can see here, it only operates under extreme conditions for relatively short periods of time. So they're actually much smarter solutions where you can adjust inlet temperatures and outlet temperatures by adding heat or by modifying the way the heat is delivered so that you can maximize the efficiency of your heat pump, minimize the size and get the best benefit. Now, what I've talked about here is, is actually 
the kind of the theory. And it's important to recognize that it's not just the heat pump unit itself. It's the heat exchangers, the choice of compressor, the type of refrigerant you choose, the efficiencies of the heat exchangers, all these factors are really important. And we need to keep in mind that you have to take a systems level approach to heat pumps. Oops, where am I? Um, yep, so where am I? Um, yep, so if we're looking at dealing with these situations of, of extreme temperatures, there are a few ways that we can get results. Uh, more efficiently. So for example, you can use what's called a hybrid heat pump, widely used in cold, really cold climates. And that's where there's a few options. Uh, one is where you just run the heat pump for the temperature uh, difference that it can do well, and then you top it up with a gas burner or with um, a resistive electricity or heat storage so that you end up with the right temperature. Um, alternatively, you can actually use waste heat to preheat the inlet air. So you're increasing the in incoming temperature and again, reducing that temperature differential. You can do crude things like just switch off the heat pump and use an existing boiler or something like that that you've already got, uh, but that's not very effective. There's also design of heat pump systems that can work better across wider temperatures. So for example, the cascaded heat pump system is really just two heat pumps where the first one takes the cold air and makes it warm. And then the second one uses that warm heat to, as the input source to get the, the final temperature you want. And you can do that as a multi-stage one as well. And that's where um, you, you have the, the two compressors, but they're built into the one package. Um, an example of effective recovery of heat from a, a nearby source is this product uh, by a company called Air Change, an Australian company called the, the Pool Pack Plus. And what this shows is if you have a typical pool, pool center being heated by just ambient air, but it gets cold, then you can have icing up problems. Uh, you will lose capacity you will, and you'll have a relatively low efficiency, in this case, coefficient of performance of 2.7. But an aquatic center is producing lots of hot, humid exhaust air. And if you feed that into the heat pump, the heat pump is now uh, running at a much warmer inlet temperature. And here we have an example where the coefficient of performance is actually improved to 50% uh, higher than it was. So these are the kinds of opportunities that, that we, can, we can see uh, if, we, if we get serious. Again, this is the uh, pool pack estimates of the savings. And you can see the biggest savings are occurring in winter. And this is particularly important today because if you're running on solar, that's when you've got the least solar. So you want the biggest savings. Uh, and second, uh, if, you're, if you're concerned about winter gas shortages or you're trying to change from gas, that's when uh, having the highest efficiency really matters most. Oops, sorry. Um, again, just to keep in mind that, that heat pumps can do lots of things in terms of heating and cooling. So of course, a reverse cycle air conditioner that lots of us have can switch between heating and cooling by running backwards. But also if you are running a heat pump to get heat, there's actually free cooling coming off the other side of the heat pump. So if you've got a need for cooling, you're basically able to tap off pretty much free cooling. And the reverse holds, if you have cooling, your chiller will be producing heat that can potentially be used. Um, some products such as the one I've just shown here that's come out fairly recently can actually provide heat in some parts of a building and cooling at the same time in other parts, which starts to uh, give you really useful uh, overall efficiency improvements. My last key point really is about here, uh, filters. Um, call out on filters is actually one of the biggest causes of costs for maintenance for air conditioners and heat pumps. Keeping the filter clean is really important because that allows the heat exchanger to work at maximum efficiency 
And so you are actually achieving the highest efficiency and the greatest capacity of output of your heat pump if your filters are really clean. So that's a big issue that, that's coming up. Um, so just to summarize, uh, heat pumps can deliver what seem like impossibly high efficiencies uh, for heating and you can get free cooling as well, but you've really got to design the overall system very well and be smart and flexible in the way you, you design it. Uh, and in particular, minimizing that temperature lift across the heat pump is really important for keeping the capital cost down and the operating cost low. Uh, lastly, uh, the heat pump space is just moving incredibly fast. Globally, there are just billions and billions of dollars being thrown at research and development. So we are seeing higher temperatures, higher efficiencies, smarter solutions, new refrigerants, all sorts of things. And unfortunately, Australia cannot describe itself as a leader in this space. Uh, we are missing out on big opportunity. So thank you for that. Many thanks, Alan. Uh, uh, missing out for the moment, but I think we're moving moving quickly. And uh, I now do have that action to go clean my filters after this webinar. Thank you. And uh, I did see there was somebody in the audience who raised their hand and hopefully they'll be able to type in their question. It looks like we have one there. I think we've got time just for one quick one. We'll have more, plenty of time afterwards uh, as well. Um, challenges and barriers of uptaking heat pumps in Australia. Uh, uh, thank you so much for that question. That really leads us into the next presentation extremely well. Um, and then we've got a, just a quick question there. I think we can take that one now. Is the difference between air-to-air -air heat pumps and earth-to-air, or, or what would be known, not also known as geothermal uh, yeah. heat, heat pumps there? Alan? Yeah, or, or ground source. Well, um, ground source, I'm, I'm not sure that ground source or, or geothermal heat pumps um, qualify under the VEU, so whether we're meant to be talking about them. But essentially what it comes down to is the temperature of the earth in Melbourne varies between about 14 and 19 degrees over the year. And so in cold weather, if you are drawing the, if you're using the heat of the earth, you get a smaller temperature difference across the geothermal or ground source heat pump. So you essentially, it's a bit more efficient. Likewise, in summer, when it's a 40 degree day, you've got a source of, of inlet temperature at, at 15. So the chilling performance of the, of the uh, geothermal system is, is much more efficient too. Uh, but it does, there are energy overheads with these geothermal heat pumps. So they're not, they're not, uh, a lay down misere as always being better than uh, other options. You need to be careful. Extreme climates, they work really well. <laughs> Indeed, and uh, the, the, uh, if you've got to go into your backyard, probably best when you've got a new, uh, a new house, building a new house or something as well, or a new building. Uh, very good. Uh, many thanks, Alan, and, and you'll be joining us for the panel discussion uh, later. And we did have the question about barriers and uptake, and, and I think this is something we can uh, go through now with, uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ahmad Majiri from RMIT, who have been working with us for the last uh, several months. Uh, lots of industry outreach and, and lots of discussion with suppliers, users, contractors, and, and so we'd, we'd like to share some of those lessons that we have there. Uh, Ahmed, I'll get you to share your screen and, uh, and take us through the presentation there. Um. Sure, thank you very much, Jared, and good afternoon to everyone. I just um, double check with you, Jared, can you hear me well? I can certainly can, and, and the screen's come up. Uh, probably just got to go back two slides and, and start presenting. Of course. All right. Um, thank you, Alan, for um, actually laying out the um, pretty much the basics of and the reason why we need to go through some of the considerations that um, anyone should take into account when they are um, thinking about switching into heat pump um, heating systems. Um, in the next 10-15 minutes, what we do is we want to go through some of the um, um, these challenges and maybe we can call them barriers, but maybe they are not really barriers, but um, challenges that need to be addressed um, in order to uh, have an efficient um, and proper heat pump installation. 
Um, we will, in, in the next two slides, I'm going through some um, introduction um, part of this, this, this part of the session. Um, and one of the things that um, I want to highlight at the beginning of the session is that heat pumps are relatively more capital intensive than other heating systems. So it is um, logical then to think about um, the amount of heat that a plant or an application will require to be supplied by the heat pump. And hopefully you can minimize the amount of heat that you need to deliver. So if we do this um, in a logical way, methodically, you will be able to um, reduce the size of the heat pump that needs to be installed and lower the capital expenditure of that investment and hopefully have a better rate of return. And um, this is absolutely sure. what we saw in the uh, these arena studies where uh, by the time you implemented whether it be any energy efficiency methods and, and you looked at uh, really understood those heat flows, we often did see that, that uh, say a one megawatt boiler or hot water generator would come down to at least half of that size that you'd need in the heat pump. So that's that uh, uh, fantastic potential to, to cut your capex in half for the necessary for the heat pump right there. Indeed. Um, so we have highlighted a few um, considerations um, as a list here that are actually going to be explained in further details in the remaining of these slides. I go through them first uh, very briefly, but then we will dive into the details of each of these um, items. Um, the first step to be able to design a heat pump system is to understand the heating requirements and the heating need of the thermal application that we have, that we are targeting. Um, this um, identification of the heat requirement um, naturally includes the amount of heat that is required, um, the required temperature, which means that when we require, let's say, two kilowatt hour of heat at um, 2 p.m., at what temperature do we need it? So the temperature is important. We will explain why. And of course, the time of that heat that is required, the time, the time of demand. Um, simply, what we ideally want to know is the daily profile or hourly profile of heat required and also how this hourly profile changes from season to season. The second option that is very natural to heat pump installations is a storage. It is tailored, it is in close relationship with the um, heat profile. We will see that usually heat profile or heat demand profile is not uniform. It varies from time to time. And um, the storage can play a crucial role there to, to um, flatten the, um, the load profile and avoid sizing the heat pumps for peak demand that we will see what it means and also reduce the electric peak load. Thermal storage has so many other advantages. Um, the other major advantage is that it does load shifting. It is able to in, in allow the heat pump to operate in different um, time of the day to be able to, for example, harvest um, on-site PV generation and turn it into heat and store it for later use in the day. Or for example, use warmer ambient air, which helps to boost the coefficient of performance of the heat pump. The other um, step is to consider the space. Heat pumps generally require more space um, compared to conventional heating system like gas absorbers, or, sorry, gas, gas boilers, or um, for example, resistive heaters. Um, there are more considerations for the space that the heat pump needs to be installed in. For example, the heat pump needs to have access to ambient air in the case of air source um, heat pumps, um, which is the topic of this work. And also if there is a possibility to install it somewhere that is close to a waste heat source to be able to recover a part of that waste heat. And of course, the savings. Um, the important thing is we want to know how much energy savings and ideally emission savings can be um, achieved through a specific heat pump um, installation. In addition to these items, there are 
they were the major um, considerations to take into account. But in addition to them, there are still a few more checks that one should um, consider when they are switching to heat pumps. When I'm switching to heat pumps, um, it doesn't mean that we are talking about only existing systems. We are talking about new builds as well, and they can consider heat pumps instead of other conventional technologies. Um, probably one item to check is um, to ensure that we are getting a quality heat pump. We will explain what this means and how to do that. The other thing is how the heating system, the heat pump system, will operate in extremely cold condition. This is what Alan highlighted uh, when he talked about the impact of uh, ambient temperature on COP and also the temperature lift. The other um, question to ask is, is this selected refrigerant for the heat pump going to be phased out? This is very important. We will um, show that if it is the case, then it needs to be considered at the beginning of the installation. Does the implementation of heat pump include any hidden costs? Um, so what we want to say is that the capex of the system is not the full story. The um, operation cost needs to be um, considered as well. And also, can the heat pump system be incentivized by the VEU program, which is the underlying theme of the entire work in this project? So in the next few slides, I'm pretty much going to repeat the same things, but with a little bit um, more details. Um, the first thing is, um, understanding the load profile, the heating load profile. We have an example of a daily load profile or hourly load profile, load profile for an example dairy farm um, with a peak thermal demand in the morning and a peak thermal demand in the evening. These are for cleaning purposes. Um, this example shows that um, the load profile, the heat demand profile is not constant uniform um, throughout the day. Um, if we install a heat pump for this, and if we size the heat pump to meet these peak demands, it means that we have oversized air and heat pump um, that will sit idle for most part of the day. So it is very logical to think that the first step is to understand how to flatten this curve, how to flatten this profile, and then size our heat pump. This is where thermal storage will play a critical role. The other aspect to understand that, which hasn't been shown on this graph, is that at what temperature heat is required in different hours. It is what we need to know as well. And another aspect is to understand how this profile changes from season to season. In this specific case, it hasn't changed significantly, but we know that heat pump um, will need to work harder to meet the same amount of heating when it is operating in winter. So probably the action required here is to get an energy audit done to understand the energy flow of the application. Um, sometimes we are not able to, under, to figure out how much heat is being consumed in different parts of the plant and no granular like, like high resolution data is available. We somehow need to infer it from the gas usage or electricity usage data. Yeah, and we've certainly seen that, Damon, where the, the BMS uh, for a building may not give the, the best information. So you may need to infer that from others. But for sure, uh, something to investigate really quickly. Can you get that hourly profile right now? You're right, middle of winter right now. It'd be great to be to make sure you're capturing that right now because that'll play a, a very big part in your design of, of the uh, heat pump replacing of that uh, that gas boiler. Uh, similarly, in an industrial setting, can, can you... Uh, properly measure that peak amount of steam requirement? Is that on a, a Monday morning when the plant starts up? Uh, how well have you got that uh, that mapped and uh, and understood right now? That's exactly right. Back to you, Ahmed. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, that's exactly right. And thank you for adding those points. Um, probably then um, one can easily draw this conclusion that when you are trying to install heat pump and because they are capital uh, capex intensive devices, um, the energy efficiency should come first. You need to reduce um, the amount of heat that is required to be able to reduce the size of the heat pump that, need, that you need to install and um, hopefully have a better um, return on investment. So um, again, the, the action that we recommend is to seek energy efficiency advice and implement them to reduce the heat load. 
Um, for different applications, th this will vary, of course. Uh, for example, for buildings, it will include things like air tightness or high, better thermal insulation. Um, for some other applications, for example, for an aquatic center, there is a huge um, number of opportunities to improve energy efficiency. For example, one of them is to make sure that the um, ventilation air change need has been designed and controlled accurately. And certainly that one that uh, Alan presented earlier on the Pool Pack Plus did have heat recovery uh, before the exhaust heat recovery, uh, before it quite captured the heat for the heat pump as well. So yeah, heat recovery first for sure. Of course. The other aspect of um, optimizing our heat load side is to revisit the temperature of heat that we require. For example, um, to most commercial buildings, the supply hot water to um, radiators um, for hydronic heating system has been set at 80 degrees C and they have been designed for that. Whereas 80 degrees C is beyond the capability of most heat pumps. There are just a few heat pumps being able to reach these temperatures and above. So we can go back, revisit those temperatures. We take actions to see whether we can reduce that required temperature, for example, by increasing the size of the panel radiator and then um, operate the same heating system with a lower temperature. If we do this, it means that we will have access to more heat pump options in the market. The price and cost of those heat pumps will come down. Um, we are using cheaper heat pumps. Usually high temperature ones are more expensive and the COP of the heat heating process increases. Uh, again, for the same reasons that Alan explained at the beginning of the session. Um, so uh, what we should probably do in this regard is um, um, to, to lower the temperature without sacrificing the um, heating power that we are delivering. It means that if we lower the temperature of the supply water, we do not want to lower the ability of the emitters or the radiators to heat up the space. What we can do, for example, we can increase the water flow rate into those radiators, um, or we can increase their size, their surface area to deliver the same amount of heat with lower temperature, with, uh, with the water at a lower temperature, or operate the heating system at a longer, for a longer period. So for example, instead of starting to heat up the space at 6 a.m. in the morning for a commercial building, we can start, heat, start heating up at 4 a.m. Um, with a lower temperature of water. And again, this applies to an industrial setting as well. Maybe you're doing some pasteurizing milk at, let's say, I'll say 75 degrees. Uh, maybe you're using hot water at 90 degrees to heat that milk up to the to 75. The question has to be asked, could we adjust the heat exchanger so that 80 degree hot water would be sufficient? Mm. Uh, that 10 degree saving uh, of temperature uh, makes a really big impact. Mm, exactly. Um, again, Jared, I would like to highlight that the, some of the recommendations that we have written here are just like hints for further explanation of these. Um, I would like to refer um, the audience to the full report that will be hopefully published and, and be available to the public in a few months. Um, exactly as you said, for different applications, there are different opportunities. So here we are with uh, thermal storage then, Ahmed, and we've got a, just a picture on the right of some very, very simple thermal storage hot water, uh, beautifully insulated with a very low heat loss there uh, per day. I think those ones there are about 0.4% loss per day, very, very small, if they're designed correctly. And, and so uh, that, that's, where you, that's what a, a thermal battery, thermal storage looks like when it's very efficient. Um, it, but what you're really doing there is if you look at that, that chart in the middle there, it's your decoupling uh, when you're using electricity and versus when you're providing that thermal heating. So this might be for a building that you're, you're cranking up the, uh, the, the heating in the morning, running pretty, pretty much full, uh, uh, full capacity through the first few hours and starts coming down throughout the day. And, and so you can use some thermal storage such that uh, you actually generate that heat when you've got maximum solar pow uh, power, uh, solar PV, and utilize those. Do that during the middle of the day, but yet, yep, provide your heat elsewhere. And we've got a comment there in the, in the chat there about noise. And of course, doing this can also help with the, the noise as well in case, in case you've, you've ended up with a noisy heat pump. In theory, a, a really high quality one shouldn't be noisy in the first place or too noisy 
uh, you know, below that 55 decibels or so. Uh, but um, if it is, then this is a great way to, to uh, decouple that as well. When we were talking together, we just um, had this idea that the importance of thermal storage uh, it cannot be overlooked. There is more to say about thermal storage and how we can talk about them in 10, 15 minutes. Um, so um, we have here highlighted a few important aspects of um, applying thermal storage for heat pump applications. Um, one is that, um, as we saw, load profile is usually intermittent and it may make heat pump to operate um, on and off, in on and off mode, which is not good for that. It is not good for its COP, not for its operational lifetime. Um, thermal storage comes into the picture. It helps to smooth the load profile, so heat pump doesn't need to vary that much. In fact, the thermal storage is absorbing that variability. Um, we will have a higher efficiency, we will have extended life of the equipment. Um, or for example, thermal storage. Um, um, the other advantage is that um, we saw that um, uh, if we size heat pumps for the, for the peak heat demand, we have oversized the heat pump for the rest of the time. Um, thermal storage comes into the picture, it shrinks those peaks um, and it reduces the heat pump capacity by reducing the peak loads, flattens the profile and can save, let's say, 10 to 30 percent on the capex and potentially thousands of dollars uh, because um, you do not need to upgrade the electrical connection of the, build, of the, um, of the site. Um, there are rising opportunities for um, variable, um, variable rate or variable price electricity during the day. Um, heat pumps without a storage will not be able to benefit fully from them. Uh, thermal storage can help the heat pump to operate during those periods that have low tariffs, low electricity tariffs and maximize their um, um, economic uh, benefits and better and, and achieve better returns. It depends on the, on the tariff structure and um, how the price changes during the day, but 50% um, potential saving is conceivable um, with, um, with careful um, control of the heat pump plus thermal storage. On-site PV generation is another aspect. Um, in the middle of the day, if we do not have enough heat demand, um, that PV generation may not be utilized fully and most of it may be um, exported back to the grid at a low price compared to the retail pr purchase price of power. Um, so with thermal storage, the heat pump will be able to shift its operation to the middle of the day when there is abundant on-site PV, a store that has heat, then use it at a later time. Again, dependent of the um, feed and tariff rates, um, potential savings of 50% is not too far from reality. I think I covered, ah, there is one more here, um, which is actually an important one. As Alan mentioned, um, operation of heat pump in cold uh, condition can reduce the COP. Um, heat pump can help, the heat, sorry, thermal storage can help the heat pump to operate during daytime, um, have a better COP, store that heat, and then deliver it to the load at a later time. Um, just as a rough estimate, if you increase the ambient temperature by five degrees, you are increasing the COP of the heat pump by around 10 to 15 percent. And of course, you can avoid the light uh, frost and ice built up on the coil. I'm, I'm cautious of time, um, so I switch to the next slide. Um, um, in terms of the space requirements, um, if the heat pump does not fit um, in the existing plant room or on the roof, um, one option is to divide a large heat pump into a smaller ones and then distribute them between various levels. Um, however, it is good to consider that um, we need to provide a fresh outside air to the heat pump and to, um, to avoid creation of microclimates around heat pumps, which means that the temperature of air around heat pumps can drop and the COP drops, or ideally um, deliver warm waste heat to the heat pump to this space. 
And if there is any possibility to install the heat pump close to waste heat source, this will be easier and we will be able to recover um, low grade waste heat to have a higher COP from the heat pump. For example, that low grade heat can be um, heat rejected by the chiller uh, that can be easily, hopefully easily utilized by the water heater heat pump. One important that, <laughs> advantage of the incentives um, included in um, the BEU program is that sometimes we hear that um, um, it is difficult to calculate or measure how much energy savings will be um, achieved through the heat pump system. This is the, I believe, the main topic that Alistair will speak after this part of uh, the presentation. I just want to highlight one important um, fact here that in order to have a better understanding of the savings, it is good to seek those incentives because it means that you have checked the system against um, um, the, the program, you have calculated its savings, you know how much savings can be expected there. So this is actually a side benefit of um, the EU program on top of the incentives, the um, monetary incentives that you directly um, get from the program. Um, very briefly about the um, components, there is so much um, to say about component qualities here. Um, as again, I believe Alan uh, mentioned in his talk, we need to think about two different aspects. One is the component qualities and the, then the system quality. The component quality, for example, um, such as whether we are using variable load compressors, electronic expansion valves, or um, thrust detection sensors. Um, these, are, these are quality components that can mean that we are using a high quality heat pump, but also on the system level, how well all of these components, for example, the variable speed pumps, fans, the control system itself, heat exchangers have been uh, integrated into one system that operates um, very effectively and efficiently. Um, probably what we need to do to ensure that the components are high quality is to get um, data sheets and certificates of each component of, and if it is possible, get them um, inspected by a third party, party advisor, seek references from previous users who have used similar heat pumps, and also um, ask about the detailed description of the warranty policy and the performance guarantee. And I believe this is the last bit here, um, the impact of um, cold, ambient, um, temperate, cold ambient air on the performance of the heat pump. Um, we mentioned that um, performance of heat pump, air source heat pump is sensitive to ambient air. In worst cases, even um, if when the temperature comes down, the COP of the system comes down, but sometimes at close to zero to five degrees, ice may start to build up on the coils and that can hamper the COP of the system more severely. So what needs to be done is that um, we ideally need to provide the heat pump with enough waste heat um, to avoid freezing and also avoid low temperature at the um, evaporator or heat source inside of the heat pump. Make sure um, that the heat pump has an auxiliary heater. Um, if you have to deliver certain amount of heat uh, for some applications, for example, um, for space heating or for hospitals, sometimes we have to deliver enough heat. We cannot just shut down our heating system for a few days in winter. However, when we are um, using those auxiliary power, we need to minimize um, the amount of um, heat that we are getting from those heaters because they are usually resistive heaters with low COP. They do not deliver the same COP that heat pump itself delivers. Um, and make sure that the heat pump with the auxiliary heater is able to report how much that auxiliary heater is operating. And finally, I would like to appreciate the contribution of the people and the companies that um, provided us with extensive generous consultation and support in this work. This is pretty much the outcome of interviews and discussions that we had with these people. I appreciate um, the contribution of each of them. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ahmed. And, and 
of, of note is that we're, we're still at the draft stage of these design and application guidelines. And so we're still open to, to feedback and anything uh, that people want to, to see in that guideline, uh, we're, we're still, still open to consider that. Uh, so if you've got some really uh, practical lessons learned from previous heat pump installations, uh, please email them through. Uh, maybe Ahmed would like to drop his uh, email address into the chat there and, and, and please feel free to share uh, that and or any case studies that you may have. Uh, a few questions coming through and we'll, we'll I think we might leave those to the end so we'll keep moving and make sure we get through the material but there is a, a, a quick one I will address is on the uh, refrigerant used and uh, we've, we'll, we'll certainly expand on that in when the design guideline comes out uh, when that's uh, that's due for release so let's hope for some time in July or August at the worst case. Um, many thanks for that Ahmed. Right, yeah, we'd like to move on to our uh, third presentation today. Uh, we've got Alastair McDowell, he's a director from Energy AE, and Alastair is gonna take us through uh, registering of uh, an air source heat pump hot water uh, within the VEU. Uh, Alastair, I've got your presentation up and running, uh, so over to you, go for it. Cool, well, thanks, um, thanks to Alan and Arvind for introducing those considerations now assuming you're all keen to go ahead with uh, designing and installing heat pumps I'm going to tell you how you can get those registered for the VU new activities that have come out this year so just a quick intro to who we are we're engineering consultancy one of a few who offer the modeling analysis for these systems such as solar water heaters and heat pumps got experience registering for these schemes for water heaters and um, we've been involved with a lot of the Australian departments over the last few years offering services and getting these off the activities on the board. So here's just a quick overview of what it looks like to register a product, a commercial heat pump water heater in this case for one of the VU activities. So the first step is as a manufacturer, this is targeted to a manufacturer who, who wants to um, get one of their products registered. You'd compile your documentation, which includes the schematics and, and also get the products tested to the relevant standards. We'll go into this in detail soon. And once you have all your information together, that would be modeled using transit software. And the modeling and the application process often done by consultants. Uh, can also be done in-house. So once you've applied to the VU, it'll undergo an audit, and once everything's approved, you'll have the product registered. So the first part of this talk will just run you through how to complete each of these steps and get a product registered on the VU. So the documentation you need is very similar to what you'll have um, compiled if you've registered for one of the residential schemes, such as the VU1D activities, or also for STCs through the SRES. So you need the system schematic, and the tank drawings. Um, if, you're, if you are um, putting together a more complex application that involves heat exchanges or more complicated control and pumps, you'll need to have the specifications for those. Uh, the VU also wants to see the data plates for each of the components. So get together all of that documentation and then uh, in parallel, you want to start testing your components. The test data will be used for the modeling in the next step. So for the testing of the tanks, you can, um, you can either use ASNZS 4692 or 4552 as applicable. If it's, um, that's, that's often what you'll have for smaller tanks is done for the residential activities. But if the tank is larger, larger than 700 liters, you can use the calculation method in the new 4234 standard. So that, that's just a, an analytical calculation. So it doesn't have to be physically tested. For the heat pump performance, you can either use ASNZS 5125, which you'll be familiar with for residential systems. There's also another option that we've introduced for it's more applicable to larger systems, uh, EN 14511. It's the most applicable international standard. So these are 
either taking the heat pump through uh, heat up cycles or testing the heat pump at a range of water and ambient air conditions. Then you, if, if the system is, um, includes individual pumps, then you need pump performance report. You also need heat, heat exchanger performance report if uh, separate heat exchangers are used and gas booster performance reports if you have gas finishing. So who can help with the testing? Intertech, TUV, SUD, SGS and BIPAC all offer these services. Um, so get in touch with them if you need a quotation for getting that testing done for the calculation method that can be done by one of the modeling consultants. So the certification, if you have, um, if you're trying to register a product with tanks less than 700 liters, that'll require certification to 2712, similar to um, just as for residential systems. So we recommend going with either SIA Global or IATMO, both great options. And then once you have that testing and all your other information together, it's time to do the modeling. So as with residential, you're using the Transis 15 software. There are some differences with this commercial method. You cannot just use the residential uh, modeling outputs. So it's a new method. It's been designed to be more applicable for a commercial application. So there's a new low profile instead of just having short bursts of water usage in the morning and the evenings, it's a bit more consistent. So it will better reflect commercial applications and industrial. There's a variable load size. So you're not just restricted to a small or a medium load. You can keep in scaling up that load size to better match the demand of a product. It doesn't have any bearing on a, a real load. It's, it's merely for for the, the purposes of comparing products against a, um, a set standardized method. So don't think that this has anything to do with actually designing your heat pump. That has to be done separately for the actual applications. Uh, the load size can change for each climate zone. So zone three, four, and five, zone four and five for VU. You can have a different load size in the modeling for each of those as opposed to having to model all load size with the same, all, all climate zones with the same load. And we're using different weather files updated to the 2021 version of the standard. So there's a, several consultancy out there, obviously ourselves uh, offering the service and as well um, Sunspin, Thermal Design, it's Graham Morrison and CCES. So th there's plenty of help out there to, to get this modeling done, it's one of the more difficult parts of this process. Then you put, the, put together the application, all of the files, such as the application form, specification sheet, and the trans modeling files are available from the VU. There's plenty of guidance there um, on how to prepare your application. Uh, the consultants that have done the modeling can also often help with this. Take that load off your hands, and then you'll be applying to the VU. So just as for residential, it's part 44, commercial and industrial activity. You can submit up to three products per application. Currently, this, this may be subject to change. Currently three per application. It's audited and you can expect, assuming no errors in your application, it'll be approved five to eight weeks, thereabouts. So once you've got your product registered, then it's eligible to be installed. So you have to install the product, decommission any existing products, submit do documentation, submit that to the VU, they will audit that submission. And then once all that's done, you'll be able to claim these. This is just a simplistic, um, simple overview of the installation and claim side of things. Um, we recommend going to the commercial industrial heat pump water heater activity guide for all of the detailed information regarding decommissioning installation and the evidence that you need to provide. You'll, um, you'll need to either become an accredited person under the VU 
or your work with an existing AEP to create those certificates. So there's plenty of, of guidance on, on the VU website on this part of the procedure. So what you've probably been waiting to see is some rough estimates, how much, how much is this incentive worth? And there's plenty of factors that go into determining how much, how much incentive you can get. Um, for any particular product, these, the certificate yield will be determined by the thermal capacity, like Ahmed's been talking about. The thermal capacity has large bearing uh, in the storage volume in particular. So because the commercial, um, the commercial scheme has this more continuous load profile, benefit from, from the larger storage volume, but um, it'll perform slightly differently to how, how the product will perform for the residential scheme due to this different load profile. So one option is to design a product slightly differently specifically for the scheme. And that's something that the modeling can, can help you analyze. So the existing capacity, there's a capacity factor which comes into play with working out how many certificates you're eligible for. If, the, if there's larger capacity on site than you're installing, then there's no limit. But if, if you're installing more capacity than exists, then there's a capacity factor that comes into play. And the certificate prices for leaks are fluctuating quite a lot at the moment. So any estimates on incentives will depend on what uh, leak price you're using. Here we've got $63. It's probably changed in between now and when this was put together just this week. But you can see you're getting more the most incentive when you're replacing an electric water heater. That's because of the, the way the emissions factors for electricity are relative to gas. Um, you can see this is just sort of summarizing the various products in terms of the capacity. Obviously, you get larger incentive, larger capacity, but it also has bearing with the storage volume. But this gives you a, a bit of an idea how much you'll be getting. So if it, if it costs a few thousand dollars to, to put each product through, you can see that it won't be long before you, you pay off that, that modeling and application cost with the rebates. So there's plenty more resources. Um, this will be distributed with the slides, so you can have a look at all of these, these links. And uh, that's all I've got for today. Just let me know if you need any assistance with getting your products on the register. We'll be happy to help you. Alistair, many thanks. Uh, that sounded pretty simple and straightforward sort of a process uh, uh, in reality. Uh, <laughs> is, is that really the case? It, it really looked like, yeah, pretty straightforward there. Um, let's talk well, if you're, if you're submitting a, a product which is already on the register for STCs or VEKs, hmm. then it is quite simple. It's just rerunning the, the different method. Good one. Slightly more complex if you're putting together a larger, larger heat pump with, with new testing, but it's, um, it's all the consultant's job yeah. to be done. <laughs> Got a couple of uh, questions here and sort of comments there. Um, one here about the uh, variable capacity compressors. Uh, are they considered in the transfer simulations? Uh, certainly uh, the comment here is AS5125 uh, doesn't consider this um, and, and nor does the EN14. Uh, 511. You come across that uh, modeling requirement for variable capacity compressors? Um, we haven't been dealing with this as of yet, but um, the person's more than happy to um, get in touch with me gotcha. by email. I can, we can have the discussion for sure. Another one here, we're talking about um, uh, maybe you can know about this one as well. The, the multiple, if you've got multiple tanks, less than 700 mm -hmm. liters each. Uh, but total capacity greater than 700 litres. Do you still need to go through the AS2712 certification for domestic units there? Uh, you, you need to have 2712 certification if the, if the individual tanks are less than 700 litres. Okay. So if they are individual tanks less than 700, that's a yes, 2712. Yep. Then. Yep. 
Uh, not quite sure I understand this question here. It says, where can we find transist modeling file on the, the, the VEU? That must yeah, be so there's, it, um, the simulation. It's file. Um, provided from the VEU. So in one of the, um, one of the application guides is a, a note saying contact the VEU for the files. So just um, using the, the main VEU information uh, Okay. email and they'll provide those template files for you and here's the one we knew was uh, coming is what's the typical uh, any ideas of a typical cost uh, to get through an application process for a single heat pump project uh, any sort of ballparks you could you could hit us with there? well i'm not sure what other consultants are charging but um, if how we've um, put our pricing together is based on whether it's a simple application that being it's already been applied for the VU and STCs then you're looking at a few thousand dollars two and a half thousand dollars to per heat pump to get it on the commercial register if you're looking at a, a product that hasn't been registered before because it doesn't fit in the residential schemes you're looking at maybe five thousand dollars per per family of heat pump and Often what we see is you have maybe one or two different heat pump capacity, uh, different heat pump units, and then you have a few different tanks. So there's lots of different combinations. So you might have 20 or, or more individual combinations that the, the pricing will reflect that in terms of, you know, we'll price mainly per heat pump unit per tank, and then it'll be just a small amount additional extra for each variation. Excellent. So that was one of the questions. Pricing shouldn't, the, the pricing's not absurd. Yeah, good. I must say that's uh, it's it's really lower than that. for, for quotation and yeah, customized your products. Excellent. That's uh, certainly much lower than and I think I'd heard and ex people were expecting in the in the tens of thousands to get to no, uh, no. Registered. So we're, we're certainly nowhere near that, which is which is great news. Good, good. Uh, Alistair, many thanks. I'm just going to, I've gone through the chat questions there. I'm just going to flick over to the Q&A and see if there's anything there we can need to go through. Uh, I might get you to stop sharing. We might bring in uh, our other panelists there as well. And we'll, uh, we'll see if there's some other questions we need to, to go through. Um, I'm going to take this one first on, on refrigerants and CO2. Uh, there is, there is that comment about CO2 and, and, and uh, delivering better quality heat. Um, I would say uh, from what we've we've been working with, with different people and the, the, the news we have, I mean, CO2, I'd say, is, is a fabulous uh, refrigerant in, in many and in certain circumstances. Uh, it does give one of the, the highest temperatures um, for your, if you want, for whatever your demand temperature is, it's really good for those high temperatures, 90 degrees and, and even a little bit higher in some cases. Um, we do see there's some limitation in the performance if it was, say, operating on a ring main. So if you had 70 degree hot water coming back to the heat pump and you need to heat that from 70 to 80, um, there is certainly quite a big uh, drop off in performance in that. The best case scenario for the CO2 is when you're heating it from a, from a lower temperature, say 20 degree hot water up to, say, 70, 80, 75, 80. Um, then yeah, the CO2 heat pump is just seems unbeatable with the, the, the COPs you can get for that one. Uh, so hopefully that answers a little bit there uh, on that one. Um, probably those those ring mains uh, and you know other refrigerants, R32, propane and what have you, ammonia, probably better when you've got that high return temperature. But CO2, uh, still worth considering. Uh, you've got some, some very good... Uh, very good supplies out there have good ways to work with in, in these different scenarios. So, yep, still worth considering that. Okay, that's, uh, I think I've just taken that one on the CO2. Let's see what else we've got here. And yeah, absolutely. Please come through and put some put some questions there. We've still got uh, a bit of time to go through them. Um, here's a question then, and maybe I'll throw this one to, to Alan. Uh, do you have suggestions regarding how to reduce the thermal storage tank size and, or occupied space? Just on mute there, Al. You got the mute. Sorry, Al, I'll have to start again. You're on mute. Yeah, I'm a bit forgetful today, aren't I? Um, oh, well, um, yeah, well, 
one one opportunity of course is to think about where you're putting your storage tanks whether you've got some spare space because uh, it can be a different place from the heat pump or you can uh, depending on structures and things like that mount them uh, on on stands or on walls or various things like that so there's there's a few ways to play with that um, another option um, that's not widely used yet, but which uh, has had a fair bit of development is to get storage tanks with phase change materials in them where you can e essentially um, capture the, the energy of, of, of melting uh, a solid at a fairly high temperature. And that also means that you've got more energy in the storage tank uh, available at that melting point temperature as well, instead of kind of having mixing, dropping the temperature off. So there's a, there's a few options there. Again, uh, a lot of it is, is really about um, how well you optimize everything. Uh, and I, I know I, I was involved with one, this was a chiller where the thermal storage was being used first thing in the morning and uh, was running out on hot afternoons when the electricity prices and the demand charges were he were coming in first. So part of it is about looking at your, your pricing structures. And this is where you can even have thermal storage interacting with battery storage and uh, uh, demand response offers and things like that as well. So th there's plenty of room for complexity here. <laughs> And, and, and really, that's, that's that modeling, you've got to run that through. If your your space is worth a thousand dollars a square meter, and you've got to give that up, and then okay, what's what's then the value of that heat pump, and versus what's that going to save you on the uh, on on the uh, heat pump and the, for the thermal storage overall? Um, the, the other one, did you mention, Alan, uh, temperature? I mean, the, the, obviously, the higher the, uh, storage temperature, uh, the more concentrated you've got for that thermal yeah. storage but yeah. of course that costs you in cop so again i'm modeling mm. uh, but yeah but again actually that's a good point jared because if you are able to run your heat pump at a time of day when the ambient temperatures are high mm -hmm. uh, you can go a bit higher temperature with a good efficiency to to store that that extra heat to to you know have it available and if you're on a, a wholesale, exposed to wholesale electricity and you've got those negative prices, which are still happening, even through winter, you still get that uh, for potentially a couple of hours per day of, of negative electricity prices. Can you tap into that and say, well, yeah, I will take that hot water tank from 75. I'll try and push it to, to 80. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe there's something there coupling that with that resistance heating just to take it that little bit higher. Mm -hmm. um, and and this, this all comes down to that the quality of controls. Uh, there's certainly... Uh, uh, the more progressive heat pump suppliers are doing a lot more when it comes to uh, solar PV forecasting and how that gets integrated uh, with the uh, the heat pump system as well. So controls, so important there. Good, good. Uh, we do have the questions on challenges and barriers for uptaking the heat pumps. Uh, I think we have answered that. But Ahmed, you know, if you were to say, you know, what, how would you put the, those challenges and barriers uh, in those uptakes just down to, you know, what's your, what's your top two or three? I would probably um, say that um, in, in different applications, probably it will vary. Um, if we talk about, for example, dense areas, multi-residential, multi-unit residential buildings, um, probably what we have learned from our consultants is that the space is an issue there. Um, for that application, probably the space is the main restriction. Temperature is not that um, problematic. Whereas um, if we look at some other applications, then temperature becomes an issue. And um, we may hear that um, heat pump is not able to deliver the required temperature. Whereas as we discussed some um, modifications to the process, better thinking about the temperature will um, enable heat pumps to play a role in those applications. Um, the other thing is that one may think that electrification of heat necessarily leads to a higher running cost. Um, it is not all wrong, it is not all true. It means that we need to engineer um, the, the heat pump system carefully. Um, the electrification of heat doesn't necessarily lead to expensive running cost. Um, 
we can reduce it, of course. Um, and also, um, one, one challenge is that, yes, we install heat pump heating system, which operates 95% um, of time, no problem. But when we hit those cold conditions in winter, as I said, we cannot shut it down. We cannot shut our plant down in some specific, in, in many applications. What do we do about that? Um, it, I, I tend to think that some kind of a backup heating system is required for many applications. And that backup system needs to still be, um, I wouldn't say efficient, but considering that um, if we do not design it properly, we overuse that backup system throughout the rest of the year, and we lead to poor performance of the entire system. And we've certainly seen that stories where aquatic centers have kept that, uh, that the gas system just for those three mm -hmm. or four days per year, uh, where, it's, uh, where it's, uh, it's very cold and just have that as a, a top up there. And taking that three or four days out had a, had a really dramatic increase, uh, a decrease rather on the capacity of the heat pump required. If, yeah, Al? Yeah, there, there are other things. For example, if you have a building which um, requires a given air change rate, then in Melbourne, most of those buildings, even overnight, will, will still be up over 12, 15 degrees. So if you've got exhaust air coming out of the building, um, you can actually use that to preheat your, uh, your heat pump. Uh, you know, there, there's once you start looking around, there are, there are lots of interesting possibilities. I mean, um, I, I had friends who were drawing the air supply for their uh, reverse cycle air conditioner in a pretty cold space for, from under their floor, uh, which which essentially is almost a geothermal heat pump, really, because mm. you've got the, all that contact with that large surface area of, of earth. Um, so there's there's lots of tricks once you start looking around uh, at what your possibilities are. Got to be a little bit creative there. Mm. Um, we had a question about the, uh, I'll just handle this one quickly, do large scale industrial heat pumps uh, need specific room temperatures where they're housed? I think we, we covered that one to say, well, the higher temperature that that uh, air source heat pumper is, is drawing upon, the better. And also make sure you don't have that microclimate. If you had it in this one sort of room and you kept recirculating the cold air coming out of the heat pump back into it, uh, you're definitely going to have some troubles there and redu reduction in performance. Um, I think we have gone through the uh, uh, using the uh, heat pump for ducted space heating. Uh, maybe if there was something, another specific question on that one, um, we could uh, you could type something in there further. We had to, uh, whoever put that maybe, one in. Pod. Maybe if if I make a point, um, this is a particular place where there's a lot of problems with clogged filters because ducted systems are very good at collecting dust. Um, so that's that's one. The other thing is that ducted systems generally have a lot of problems. Um, the um, there was a study done for Sustainability Victoria suggesting that ducting losses are fifteen to fifty percent uh, in in a lot of domestic systems. Um, so there's there's big issues there, and with with heat distribution, um, there's also um, the opportunity to um, deflect the heat away from the windows and the walls. If you've got, for example, a floor mounted ducted system, you can, at hardware shops, you can buy clip on deflectors, which will push the warm air into the room instead of blowing it across the single glazed window and undoing the still air film, which is 60% of the thermal resistance of a single glazed window. Uh, so th there's a lot you can do here. The other thing too is that a lot of ducted systems actually are associated with significant increases in air leakage because essentially the return air tries to draw air from the most convenient source, which may well be the fixed opening in the toilet or bathroom or laundry near the return air register instead of circulating the uh, air from separate rooms. So there's a lot of building related stuff I would be doing to minimize the operating cost of, of the heat pump um, and the sizing before I try to replace a ducted air system. 
One, thanks, thanks, Al. Um, I'll try and step through a couple more quickly here. Um, in terms of the saving of electricity, look, this is uh, we A two E P has done a a bit of a tool there to help you with that one. Uh, if you if you go to the Future Heat website and look on the tools, there's a, a simple design tool which translates the heat demand into COP and elect new electricity, and then savings from that as well. Um, and there's a comment there, how do you prevent the, uh, the heat pump from running all day? Uh, well, a common term is, is can be recovery rate and, and how quickly the heat pump produces, say, hot water. Uh, but it's really a matter of sizing and working through to say, well, this, this needs to be specified so that it generates enough heat to recharge that thermal battery over, say, an eight hour period under these certain conditions. And that'll be under certain ambient conditions. It certainly should be not be expected this to be run, this heat pump will be running 24 uh, seven. Whilst you get better utilization and capacity out of the heat pump, uh, um, you know, it'd be very hard to match it with the right uh, uh, tariffs going forward, uh, electricity tariffs that is. Um, okay, um, we've got other questions about what level of savings rebates can be expected on a single commercial building using a, a heat pump for uh, HVAC. Um, I'm sure if we've got any, any, uh, anyone able to, to answer that one, it's, it's very so much from installation to installation. Um, Jared, I would note that the, uh, the issues paper that we released for this activity uh, which you can get if you Google commercial industrial heat pump water heaters and engage Victoria, uh, does have some, um, some kind of calculations on what kind of rebates you get through VEU, what kind of incentives, but of course there's a lot of variables involved in it. So it's, um, depends on the big price and the size and efficiency and all sorts of things. Good one. Thank you. So yeah, some further help needed there. Um, Question there for, from uh, um, I've got one from Peter Teo asking about the uh, the what the, what should the performance should that be done on a, on an overall system, not just the heat pump itself. Um, so that the way you're looking at things like the storage tank and how well they're insulated. Uh, Alistair, have you got a, a comment on that one? Yeah. So with with the modelling, it's a component test system simulation, which means you, you test each component of the system. So the heat pump, the tank, anything else, and then simulate the system as a whole. So yeah, I hope that explains things to you. Definitely look at system, perfect, yeah. No use having a, a thermal storage which is giving up 20% uh, of its heat each day or, uh, yeah, or so. Um, Couple of other questions there. One of the, a couple of them a bit too long for us to, for me to take there, and and we might take that one offline and, and look at that one uh, directly. I thought within the last uh, couple of minutes, I might try a quick uh, Slido poll, if I may. So I'm just going to uh, to bring up a uh, Slido question to see if we get some uh, comments there from the audience and see what they're thinking of. That's not the Slido poll. That's Alistair. Um, and just wondering if uh, if there was any comments that we'd, uh, we'd like to grab and, uh, from you here about the quality of heat pumps. And, and feel free to type something in there. What do you think makes a, a high quality heat pump installation? And, and we're very aware of this because, I mean, heat pumps have been around for a, a long time and they've had some uh, a bumpy road, certainly in the residential market, where uh, uh, noisy heat pumps that cannot produce enough hot water in the day and do not completely heat up the entire tank. Uh, they don't have a perfect name about them due to some uh, lower quality installations that have happened in the past. And uh, so we've got yeah, certainly ideas and we, we've talked about that today about how to address them, but uh, we're, we're more than happy to take some more feedback. And, and what is your perception then of a higher quality heat pump? We really want to make sure that's uh, uh, reinforced and, and, and uh, give you the right guide to head towards that. Now, I've got a couple of people typing. I'll just give that a minute or two. And and uh, we'll see what comes through there. And Jared, just while people type, uh, Renero did ask that his questions were discussed. Alistair, I think, can answer the first question, Renero. The second question on appropriate sizing of a VU44 activity, which is this activity we speak of, about. Yeah. Uh, you know, really, it, it is up to the, the end user and, and the credit provider um, to talk through these things and any other parties that, that may be involved in the activity. You can't create certificates unless you have an accredited provider working with you. Uh, and, you know, DELP is, is keeping an eye on this activity, making sure we're getting good outcomes for consumers. So, um, you know, it's a big part of why we're doing this in industry capacity yeah. building process to make sure we, 
we uh, we get people doing the right thing and understanding how to do the activity. Brilliant. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Alistair, were you able to take that first question we had there uh, from uh, Rani? Uh, that's regarding the the temperature specification. It, it's it's a good question, actually. Um, something that I think we should think about, and we'll, we'll get back to Rani, but it's considered to be just a standard rating condition, 20 degrees water temperature, 20 degrees air, but uh, he raises a good point about the, the fact that them, this may be an overestimate for the year. So I think we'll, we'll have a bit more of a look at that. Okay. Does that require a change in methods or just a, require a change in the way you guys are doing modelling? Or what do you think? Well, the rated capacity is used to um, define the capacity factor. So that only comes into play if you're installing more heat capacity than existing capacity. So if you're just installing less, then it has no bearing what, what the rated condition is. Mm. Um, this, yeah, so it's only used for that purpose. So... It, it's not necessarily critical whether it's a conservative or a estimate, but perhaps we could look at it more closely if Ronnie has any ideas what a better condition would be to rate the, um, the capacity. Good one. I'll make sure you guys are linked up after this one, unless you've got Ronnie's details already. Good one. Well, many thanks for the, the comments back through there. And uh, yep, plenty of good <laughs> tips there. And we'll uh, we'll take those into consideration. See how we can weave them into the, the guidelines as appropriate. Uh, we thought we'd just ask uh, one quick poll here to see who see what's happening out there with various. Uh, we have a few suppliers online and a few APs and things like that. Just uh, thought we'd have a quick uh, poll on on uh, who's who's getting ready to make some uh, registrations there. So uh, feel free to uh, to put in uh, something on that um, in the multiple choice. There we go. We've got a few that are ready to to move on this one. Um, it looks like uh, this this might be a measure of how busy it could be over the next three months here, Alistair, so with a bit of luck. Okay, so people are looking a bit further ahead and and but uh, certainly quite a few are getting ready to act over the next uh, over the next few months. That's good because certainly in the in the first few months of the uh, of the program, there wasn't many registrations and things happening. but Alistair? yeah we've had quite a, f a lot of interest for the residential products, obviously mm -hmm. the they don't need any more testing, but the challenge is for those products that need the EN14511 testing or additional testing. So we've had we've had a bit of interest from some larger manufacturers, larger, larger capacity units. So it looks like we've got a, uh, certainly some intentions to get moving over the next three months, which is great. Very good. Yeah, just note, Jared, um, so that the product registration uh, status is available online from the Essential Service Commission and last count there were nine products approved for this activity and nine products pending assessment so uh, okay. from a variety of brands there but um, certainly good to see interest in the activity. Oh great that's moved on really well in the last couple of months then Jack fantastic. Uh, Jack just before I go to the next uh, steps and, and uh, going what we're doing going forward any uh, sort of closing or final comments from yourself there? No look I, I think I'd like to uh, send my appreciation to the to the panel of speakers. I think it was excellent presentations today and, and really interesting and informative stuff. And it does underline the uh, some of the you know complexities of this activity. We want to make sure that people understand it. It's not it's not rocket science, but it is certainly uh, if you like more difficult than changing a light bulb. So um, A 2 EP has got some great resources out there. So make sure you jump onto the website and have a look at that. And I think uh, Jared will have a second webinar at some point in the future and and also be putting out a, a technical guidance document as well. So really appreciate those that are still with us um, for participating. And thanks, thanks to the panel. Thanks, Jared. Uh, many thanks, uh, Jack, and I'll echo that as well. Thanks to uh, thanks to Alan, uh, Ahmed, and Alastair for the presentations today. Uh, so yes, going forward, we're, we've got the final draft uh, of this, uh, the guidelines happening now, and uh, and being approved through July. Uh, we have a second webinar happening on the twenty first of July at three pm. So same time. Uh, was about four weeks from today and we'll go through more of the application guides we're going to do deep dives into things like aquatic centers and dairy farms 
uh, and uh, and uh, multi-residential buildings. So a bit more getting into a bit more on the nuts and bolts and the practicalities of, of doing these installations. So uh, uh, that uh, registration for that uh, webinar will be open sometime in the next couple of days. And people that join this webinar and registered will we'll send you off that uh, in, uh, invitation to that one. And then we're hoping that their guidelines are published. So either towards the end of July, but I've been a bit conservative and say sometime in August, but we're, we're, we're pushing to get this all done and finalized and looking great for you in in, in July. Um, so that's uh, fairly much it from me at uh, A2EP. Uh, we do have, uh, just to let you know, there is a, a nice big uh, conference coming up in, in October where we're going to be looking at uh, decarbonisation uh, uh, and different pathways to do that. Uh, if you do want anything more from A2EP, uh, by all means, uh, uh, go to uh, LinkedIn and we've got pr plenty of posts and things like that. You can follow us on there. Um, so other than that, uh, I'll just, oh, I've got quite a few comments in there and chat that have come through at the end there. I don't think we'll have a chance to uh, finish that in the last minute or so. Um, but uh, many thanks for those people that asked questions today. And, uh, and uh, thanks very much for joining us. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.